the last few weeks we've been in this series called Lordship, Ownership, and Stewardship. These are some of the things that we have covered. Let's put these up here real quick. These are definitions of, of these three words. Lordship means the position or authority of a Lord, all power and all authority, the top rank. To rule or have dominion, to rule all territory. This is what it means for the Christian. It means I acknowledge ownership and I give up all of my personal rights by yielding to Christ's lordship. We talked about that last week when we talked about the sovereignty of God. I give up all my personal rights. Wow. I give up all my personal rights. I can, pre- I can just park it right there and preach on that. I give up all my personal rights. By yielding to Christ's lordship, giving unreserved obedience in essence, if he is Lord, we do what he tells us to do. The next definition about ownership. Ownership means a legal right to have possession, proprietorship, which means to have exclusive right or title to something because you have legal possession of it. The Bible says we were purchased with a price, the precious blood of Jesus. We're not our own anymore. He owns us. And then finally, The word stewardship, which we will get to this a little bit later in the series, means a surrogate who manages the property, estate, or financial affairs of another, the responsibility to oversee or to protect something. If we deal with the lordship issue, let's put this up, Sarah, this is what's settled in our life. Lordship settles the position issue, the permission issue, the profession issue, and the possession issues of my life. Let's put this next one up here. This is where we're going to find ourselves today, bridging where we were last week. So we went a little bit deeper last week, and we want to talk about what is lordship. What does it really mean? What's the word have to say about it? And so last week, we dealt with the first part of these five points. Lordship is accepting God's sovereignty. And if you weren't here, I encourage you to go back and watch the live feed or watch that on YouTube. We really went deep last week. Today, we're going to talk about number two on this list And it is lordship is a God-first life. Lordship is a God-first life. Now, you remember a few weeks ago when I said, if I come in with these post-it notes, (laughs) I come in the office beginning of the week after that, Pastor Angie put a post-it pad on my, my desk. Preach away, preach away. It can be dangerous. (laughs) <laughs> Let's put this scripture up here, Sierra. Wow. Seek first. A couple of weeks ago, I was in a uh, state council meeting with the Church of God state council, and, and our, st- our state overseer was in there with our state youth director, and there's a mission project that they're getting ready to bring forth to the state of Indiana. I think they put it on their Facebook page. I'm going to present it to the church here in the next few days. And it's a couple of pressing needs around the world. The first one was the Maui fires. And we've lost some churches. We've got some church of gods over there that we've lost. And the other one really affected me. And when I saw it, it impacted my life. And I knew the Lord wanted me to touch on it just briefly as I preach today. And it was in Pakistan. The government in Pakistan has switched regimes. Now, when you're dealing with that part of the world, Afghanistan, Pakistan, you're dealing with radical Islamists. Christianity is an enemy. Well, for a while, Christian churches have been able to exist in Pakistan despite the fact that their government rule is, in a lot of ways, a theocracy. It is an Islamic rule. But Christian churches have thrived, and the Church of God has a lot of churches over there that have been planted. And matter of fact, here a few months ago, I was speaking, it was, it was Brother Sam Abbott who passed away. He asked me around the first of the year, he said, you want to go to Pakistan on a mission trip with me? <laughs> Amen. He's dancing with Jesus right now. But he asked me if I wanted to go, and I said, well, I'm going to have to pray about that. Well, during the course of the year, the regime change has taken place in that country. And I sat in that council meeting a couple of weeks ago, and they showed the state council videos of what's happening over there. Does anybody know what's going on over right now to the Christian church in Pakistan? 
They're going into churches, and in one city alone, now this was two weeks ago, and I'm sure we've lost more. The church of God lost 21 churches. Because what's happening is they're going in during church service. And they're running people out. And they're burning the churches down. And in one of the videos, there was somebody who had climbed to the top of the church, and they had a cross, and they were kicking the cross off the top of the church. And in the streets was these radical Islamists, and they were cheering on, and, you know, Allah is great, and Allah is great. So we lost 21 churches. And I sat and I watched it, and I thought, I wonder what would happen in America if... We knew when we came to church that a mob of people would come in and kick us out and would burn our church to the ground. Would we still come to church? Or would we sit back and say, thank God for live stream? Because this is, this is not the end of it. Over a hundred people were followed when they left. And they burned their houses down too. Pastors' homes were burned. Members' churches were burned. Leaders' churches were... So it wasn't just them being persecuted for their faith by going to church and being kicked out. And tearing the church down. But the members of the church would go home and they would follow them home. And they would do that to them too. I, I, I wonder, I, I just, I wonder how many of us, if we knew that was happening, would have the boldness that those Pakistanis have in standing up for Christ. And I saw that, and I saw that video, and it, and it just hit me. And I was convicted. Because in America, we, we serve God in a very peaceful environment. And, and a matter of fact, America has its own form of Christianity. Did you know that? When you go to the other parts of the world, if you go to uh, India or if you go to Africa, you especially go to the Middle East, their brand of Christianity is different than our American brand of Christianity. Because overseas, they understand truly what it means to seek first the kingdom. They know what it's like to give up everything for the cause of Christ. In, in, in America, it's an inconvenience if, if we got to attend more than one service a week. It, it's an inconvenience if there's uh, qualifications or guidelines that come to us if we want to do ministry. It's an inconvenience. And I'm thinking, God, we need an awakening in America. The church needs an awakening to where we get back to seeking first the kingdom. And see, we can blame the casino, and we can blame meth, and we can blame crime, and we can blame, blame corruption in government. We can blame all those things in the city of Terre Haute, and we can say, that's why our city is a mess. No, I propose to you this. It's a mess because the church hasn't been seeking first the kingdom. Because our city needs to see a believer like those Pakistani believers that say, you can burn my church down. You can follow me home and burn everything I have down. I am not bowing my knee to Islam. I'm not ashamed of the cause of Christ. And if you start dragging Christians out in the public square and killing Christians now, I will not deny the name of Jesus because when I gave my heart to Jesus, he became first. And everything in my life. Is anybody here? Is anybody convicted over that? Because, see, I sat down with another minister a few months ago over lunch, and we were having a minister's meeting, and I was talking to him, and, and he's been to China. And he said over in China, in certain portions of China where Christianity is illegal, he said they have to have churches and in homes and in basements, and they'll do it at night. But even then, the people still will congregate. 
So in Pakistan, they knew their church could be burned and they still came to church. They knew that they would be followed and they would burn their homes down and they still made it to church. In China, people still made it to church knowing that they could be thrown in prison for being a Christian. And this is what they do in, in China. This is what they do. They'll go in one or two people at a time and they'll space it out. And then one or two people will go in. And then one or two people, because if there's too many people, then it brings a scene and it causes the government to show up. And they don't have Bibles. And I asked the pastor, I said, well, how do they do it if they don't have Bibles? He said, the pastor memorizes it. And you know what they do when they go home? They memorize scripture. The parents memorize scripture and teach their children scripture from memorization. But seek first the kingdom of God. And so when I'm putting this message together, and especially a couple of portions of Scripture, I'm getting ready to go over this morning, it punched me in the gut. And it was a gut check, and I'm like, Lord, do I really seek first the kingdom? Do I really live like your Lord of my life? Let's put this Scripture up, Matthew chapter 22. Are y'all here with me today? Jesus was confronted by the Pharisees, who were always looking for a way to confront him. And they, they wanted to get Jesus trapped in his words. And so they come to Jesus and they know that there's 10 main commandments. But if you look up the Old Testament altogether, there's like 611 commands. The ceremonial law, the moral law, and all the other laws combined, there's like 611 and more than just the 10 commands. And so they approach Jesus to try to trap him, and they say, Jesus, which, which is the greatest one? What, what, what's the, and, and Jesus comes back in verse seven, 37, and he says, you'll love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And I'm going to show you where it's at in Deuteronomy chapter 6. So he, he quotes to them what Deuteronomy chapter 6 says, where it's found. And then in verse 38, he comes in, and he says, that's the first, and that's the great command. So Jesus didn't repeat all 611 laws. He repeated the one because Jesus understood, like Matthew 6.33 says, that if we can seek first the kingdom, everything else is taken care of. If we can love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our mind, and all of our strength, and everything that's within us, then nothing else is going to be creating a tug of war within our passions and our heart. If we can get that straight, everything else will be taken care of. And so when I think of the issue of lordship, this is what I really think about. It's a love issue. It's a heart issue. It, it, it really goes back, and it's a personal issue, okay? It's an issue of, do I really love the Lord? I, I, when, when you see people love something, I mean, they give their all to it, right? When they love something with all their heart, their mind, their soul, their strength, they give it their all. And when I thought about this, and when I thought about it, I thought, this is exactly why. And I want, you, I want you to hear me, okay? Don't take what I'm saying out of context. I don't chase, chase people down anymore in church. Oh, pastor. That's a pretty bold statement. This is what I mean. Jesus said, leave the 99. Pastor, won't, will you leave the 99 if, if somebody strays? I do. I do. But when I reach out to somebody and try to pull them out, if they don't want out, I can't help them. I've been doing this long enough, man. If people don't want to serve God and they don't want to love him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, then no matter what I do, they're not going to come out of their situation. And it doesn't matter how many times I text, how many times I message, how many times I call, how many times I email, how many times I show up at their house. I will do it when I feel I'm seeing some fruit. I'm making a difference. I'm sowing some seed. But if people love the Lord, they're going to do it with their lifestyle. And, and we need to understand that. You serving the Lord, I want you to hear me. You serving the Lord or whatever area of your life that you're choosing not to surrender to the Lord, it's a heart issue. 
And, and I can't force. That's why religion, you know, we talk about religion. I know religion gets a bad, I mean, religion is in Scripture, and it does talk about it in the book of James, you know, if our religion is, is undefiled before God. So religion in Scripture is referring to our acts of service to the Lord and what we do as we serve the Lord. And I get it, religion gets a bad name, and people are only doing it out of duty instead of desire. And so when I use the word religion now, that's what I'm referring to. And I get it that some people only do things out of duty. I'm only here because the pastor, he'll call me on Monday if I'm not here. (laughs) I'm only here because my family member wants me here. I'm only here, you know, because I want to look good in the community. This is what God wants. This is what God wants. A heart that says, when I give you my heart, Jesus, no other God I'm going to follow. No more passions. This world's behind me. I'm not going to serve it anymore. You saved me. You died for me. You showed mercy to me. I could be in hell right now. I heard somebody this last week say, uh, does God send people to hell? And this is my thought. We were already on our way to hell before Jesus came. He just rescued us from it. So the next time somebody comes to you and says, would a loving God send somebody to hell? This is what you say. No, 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 no. When we were born, we were already on our way to hell. What God did is it provided us a way out of it. So if we go to hell, it was our own choice to go there. So this is the first. This is the great command. So knowing how I am, let's put this next scripture up here. I thought, well, let's, okay, and Jesus comes in. We'll talk about this a little bit later. I'll put a bookmark here. And he says, the second is like it. You love your neighbor as yourself. That's why some people just can't get involved with anything to do with church. That's because they don't like people. <laughs> Put a bookmark. We'll deal with that in a future lesson. Let's go to Deuteronomy. I'm just being, I'm being honest with you. I love God, but I don't go to church. Why don't you go to church? I mean, we can lie about it all we want, but really, let's just be honest. We don't like being around people. We don't know how to work out issues. We don't know how to forgive. We hold on to grudges. We get offended. We get hung up on something. And we just, and Jesus said, if you're going to say you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you better love your neighbor as yourself because these two. Because see, when Jesus came in with that second command, it was foreign to them because they were never told that in the Old Testament. Jesus comes in and says, that's the fulfillment of the law. That's how you understand grace. That's how you understand the price I paid for you that now you can love somebody else that doesn't deserve it because I died for you and you didn't deserve it. And that's what really shows your love for one another, learning to work with people you don't agree with, with one cause, the kingdom. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. So I'm like, okay, the Lord said, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he moved on. He just said it in one verse. Now, you got to understand his audience So when Jesus said that, his audience were Pharisees. They knew the 611 commands. And so when Jesus made that statement, they knew exactly where it was located. And they knew all the other verses around it. So I'm like, so when Jesus, he assumed they understood the the length, the, the, the width of what that meant. And so I thought, well, let's go to Deuteronomy. Let's find out where it's at. And let's see what it means to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and then that makes sense. Let's rightly divide truth. Let's go back to where the source material is. So Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, it says, You'll love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. So Jesus quoted that in Matthew chapter 22. But, he, but the Lord expounds in verse 6 to, I believe, 12 or more. We'll get to there. Well, let's go to verse 6. What does it mean to love the Lord with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength? And he says, these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart, verse 7. Get this, get this. So the Lord is saying, if you really love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you're going to learn the word. That's what he said in verse 6. I love Jesus. You better, now listen, I know we don't worship the book of the Bible. I worship the author of the Bible. But his words are a love letter to me. And they're words that he has spoken to me. And I love his word because he is the word, the living word. Does that make sense? I know some people, they kind of worship a Bible, and I'm not not saying that. So when Jesus says, you love the Lord, you're going with all your... If I'm Lord of everything, you're going to want... Verse 6, you're going to want to know your word. You're going to want to know my heart. 
I mean, if, if, if somebody died for you and he's the creator of the universe and he made you and, and he created you and he gave you 66 books to explain his plan for your life, don't you think you ought to read it? Amen? I mean, I, I, everything's different with the digital age, but some of us grew up in the, in the day and age when you, when you were in school, you got notes passed to you. Hey, remember those days. Come on. Little notes slipped under the desk. Or you go out to your locker and there's a note that's been put into the vent. <laughs> and if it's somebody that you're really interested in, man, you couldn't wait to open it. You, yeah, I got to go to the bathroom. And you go to the bathroom and you're sitting there and you open it and you read it. <laughs> Listen, before email, before email. That's how, that's how we communicated. Amen. I kind of miss those days. How many of you are like, man, I kind of miss those days? <laughs> Back when we all used to write cursive. You know, I, I saw somebody say, you want to stop the world right now? Require cursive writing and stick shift driving. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. My second, third car was stick shift. <laughs> Boy, it would stop the world, wouldn't it? Amen. So he says, you're going you're gonna to know the word. You're going to love it. You're going to crave it. And then he goes up another level. And this is, going to be some, this is going to be convicted to some people. And the Lord says, this is what I really mean if you love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You're going to teach your children my word. <laughs> You're not just going to throw them to the world and hope maybe when they get older, maybe they'll serve the Lord. You're going to love your children enough that you're not only going to teach them, you're going to live it in front of them. Are y'all listening to this? So, so, so God says, this is what real love means. And, and, and you're going to talk about the Lord when you're in your home. And they're going to witness you walking in the way of the Lord. So when they see you struggling, they're going to see you standing on the word. When they see you tempted, they're going to see you standing on the word. When they see you going through tough times, they're not going to hear you talking negative and complaining and griping. They're going to hear the word of the Lord. When faced with compromise, they're going to hear you say, I will not bow my knee to that. When they're struggling with something, you're not going to say, oh, no, it's okay. No, this is what you're going to say. Oh, no, it ain't okay. Well, that goes on in our home. Oh, no, you didn't, and you won't. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Anybody that knows Jovi knows that she, she deals with the tough issues. Anybody in the youth on Wednesday, they know. She's just going to come right out and just deal with it. This is what we're going to talk about. We're going to deal with this. We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about abortion. We're going to talk about LGBTQ. We're going to talk about these issues that are facing you because it needs to be talked about. In the youth. If we're going to learn about it, they better learn about it at church. Because if you love the Lord, you're going to raise your children up and you're going to teach them what God has to say about it. And you're going to teach them the truth of the word of the Lord. Am I making any sense in here? So not only are you going to teach them, you're going to live it. And you're going to do it from the time you lie down and rise up every hour of the day. Jesus is going to be glorified in your home. That's what he's saying. If you really love the Lord, he's going to be glorified in your house. Verse 8. And he says, and you're going to bind them for a sign upon your hand. For they shall be the frontlets between your eyes. I mean, that's the word. They carried the word everywhere they went. So anytime they were faced with a situation, they knew what the word said. Anytime a temptation came, anytime a choice in life came that would conflict with their Christian convictions, right there's the word. I can't get away from it. Right there it is. And God is saying that when you love the Lord, that's how you're going to be now. You've got to translate that to the New Testament, and you've got to spiritualize that. I understand it. So basically, this is what the Lord is saying. Everything you do, Matthew 6, you better seek the kingdom first. 
You seek the kingdom first with your finances. You seek the kingdom first with your, with your marriage. You seek, the first, seek first the kingdom when it comes to your career. Everything has to be filtered through Jesus first, not Jesus second. Not Jesus third or fourth. And it's amazing how many believers that when it comes to the Lord, he's not the first choice in who they choose to consult when making decisions. I mean, if you're single, it's not a debate. Do you, do you know Jesus? Yeah, no, done. Boop, kick, delete. Sorry. Oh, I'm not giving away too much information here, but when, when Jovi and I met, when Jovi and I met, she had been single for 13 years, and it's funny because when I'd go visit her in Iowa, we'd go to church together. And uh, her attitude was, okay, you say you're a preacher. Let's see how you worship when you come to church with me. She said, you say you're a preacher, but I'm going to see how you worship when you come to church with me. And I'd bring my Bible, and I'd open it up, and she'd seen all these little notes. And she'd tell me, she said, yeah, these guys, they'd say they were Christian, and I'd take them to church with me. And their Bible looked like they just got it off the rack at the Bible bookstore. <laughs> there ain't nothing written in there. It's like... Oh, so you're just trying to get in good with me saying you're a believer, huh? Wow, that went over really good, didn't it? Amen. We must have a lot of single people in here today. Amen. Amen. Listen, listen I don't hold back. I don't care. You get mad at me, throw something at me. I don't care. You can leave and snot and spit and not come back anymore. I'm telling you right now, I don't care, male, female. If you love Jesus, if they don't love Jesus, it's over. Game over. Sorry. We'll talk when you start to know who Jesus is. I'm not going to have, because the Bible says not to be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. I don't have the time or the drama. I don't have the emotion to have to try to be Jesus to you. I'm serving the Lord. God said in his word that I got to seek him first. And you don't know Jesus. And sorry, Jesus said no. I, maybe I need to get into my ending because I don't know. I, I mean, this isn't going over too well. I mean, yeah. Jesus first, sorry. So, Jesus first. Jesus first. We're getting ready to make a financial decision. Ooh, babe, I don't know if we're going to be able to tithe, then we don't, but then we don't buy it. Man, I don't know if I ought to sign it. Man, I'm going to be missing church. Then, then I don't get involved in it. Man, I don't know, man. I, don't, I, I feel like God's called me to do this, but man, if I, if I do this, I don't know. If I, then you don't do it. Listen, I'm just preaching the truth. You know what? This, this is Bible, you know? You know, this is Bible. Basic instructions before leaving earth. This is so easy right here. I mean, when you give your heart to the Lord, you get that B-I-B-L-E. Let's keep reading. Some of you are like, you were doing good when you were sticking to the scripture. Now you started meddling, man. You, start, you lost me when you meddled. Just get back to reading the scriptures. Amen. <laughs> you're going to write them on the post of your house. Now, you, you're going to see there's a reason for this. Okay. Not as much physically. And I know sometimes we, uh, we build this building program out here. We wrote things. You got to spiritualize it. So this is what the Lord is saying. Everywhere you go in your home, it needs to give honor and glory to the Lord. To the point that it's on the post of your home. So that way, when anything comes to your mind, you can turn around and there's the word. I turn around, it's written around my wrist. I turn around, it's written around my neck. I turn around, it's written on a post. So you spiritualize that. And so the Lord is saying, every moment of every day, no matter what you're facing, you've got to put the word before you. Why? Because God knows human nature. And if we don't put the Lord first, we will always gravitate toward what we want. Come on. Come on. Go to the next verse. So, so see, when Jesus said, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and he's referring to Deuteronomy 6, you've got to explain what Deuteronomy 6 says in order to understand it. It's more than just, oh, I, lo I love Jesus. Well, let's see. This is, this is the test. And it shall be when the Lord your God shall have brought thee into the land which he swore unto thy fathers and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob to give thee great and goodly cities which you didn't build. Look at verse 11. Th th I'm telling you, I'm going to show you how this ends. And houses full. 
And we sang it today, and Lorraine didn't know what I was preaching on. She sang when it talked about the goodness of God and how we should always be grateful for the things he's done for us, the blessings he's given to us. He, he gave us things we didn't deserve, G- gave us blessings we didn't, we didn't really have to fly. I mean, we did, but we really didn't have to work for. Amen. And he says, he's done these things for you. He, 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 he gave you wells you didn't have to dig for, vineyards you didn't have to plant. And he's saying the reason why is because God loves you and he's provided for you. Look at verse 12. All of these things he's done for you. Listen, some of you wouldn't be sitting here. Some of you would be six feet under right now if it had not been for God. So, now, you can't remember, some of you right now would be spending an eternity in hell if it had not been for Jesus. I'm telling you right now. Listen, if it wasn't for Jesus, I'd have split hell wide open. I mean, Paul said he was the chiefest of sinners. I'm telling you right now, I'm t- I was a chief sinner. I mean, I, I, and I loved sin. I liked sin. I loved it. I loved I had fun. It was fun. It was fun doing what I wanted to do, when I wanted to do, and appeasing to my flesh. And when I backslid on the Lord and got seven times worse, it was a wake-up call to me. And when I got that demon cast out of me and I gave my heart to Jesus, when I fell on the ground of Country Place Apartments in Paoli, Indiana, the third Sunday of 1989, and I said, God, take it all. I meant it. I renounced everything. I renounced all lifestyles, all relationships, all sin, all addictions, everything. I renounced it and I said, God, no more. I'm not, if I'm doing this, I'm doing it right. If, if I'm, I didn't grow up in church. I didn't even, listen, I didn't even know that there were certain books in the Bible, okay? Some of you know that. I've talked, I thought, jo, I thought the Jonah was, was Moby Dick's story. I, 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 I didn't know that it was in the Bible. He got swallowed by Griffith. That's Moby Dick. No, it was Jonah. He got swallowed by Griffith. Wow, amazing. Wow. That's in the Bible. I didn't know any of that. But when I gave my heart to Jesus, I renounced everything because he just saved me. I thought I was overdosing. I thought I was dying. I I, I had a bad concoction that night of, of alcohol, hard alcohol, dope, acid, and all three combined. I thought I was dying. I thought I was having an overdose. And I went into the bathroom, and when I looked in the mirror, I thought that my skin was burning. And I knew I'd backslid on the Lord. I knew I'd turn my back on God. And I'm looking in the mirror, and I'm like, Dennis, you're dying right now, and you're going to hell, and you know better because you turned. You turned your back on Jesus. You knew the gospel, and you backslid on the Lord. And I thought I was dying, and you better believe I cried out to God. And when God delivered me that morning from that demon, and when God saved me that morning, and I didn't die, you better believe I gave him my... And I, and I, I was I wasn't even, it was right before my 20th birthday, and I didn't care if I lived to be a hundred every year. I give it to you, God. I will turn my back on every every sin, every addiction, every lover, every passion, every I'm turning it back, and I don't care. I'm not gonna be ashamed of the gospel. I'm giving it all to you because you just delivered me from an eternity in hell. You know, there's sometimes, I said, I said, some of you probably wouldn't like some of the prayers I pray for some of you that are playing games. Well, I tell you what, there's probably somebody praying for me. And this was probably what they prayed. Lord, <laughs> let, let him go as far as he can without dying. Dangle him over the fire just a little bit. And, and let him feel the heat on his toes and hear the screaming and then pull him back and just, just see. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we ought to return back to those prayers again. Lord, let's, let's let him see what you saved him from. Let him see what their life would be without you. Let him see what awaits if they took their last breath now. And this is what he says. He says, you better do these things. You better serve me this way. And beware lest you forget the Lord. That's what he says. 
He says, the reason why you got to put the word around your neck and around your forehead and around your wrist and every doorpost and everywhere you turn is God said, I know people. This is God. This is God. I know people. They forget me quickly. They come to church and they slobber and they snot. God, please help me with this situation. And they walk right out, get in their car and cuss their kids out on the way home and go right back to their sin. They just go right back to it. And God said, I'm telling you this because I know human nature. Because lest you forget the Lord. And you forget what I did to you. And you forget the price I paid to bring you out of Egypt. I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you out of the house of bondage. Do do, do we keep, is, is that the last verse on there, Sierra? William Booth the founder of the Salvation Army said this when he began the Salvation Army over a century ago. This is what he said. He said, God has all of me that there is. There have been others with greater plans, greater opportunities, with greater potential than I, talking about his qualifications to lead the Salvation Army. He said, there's a lot of other people that could be doing this and doing a whole lot better job than what I'm doing. He said, but from the day I had a vision of what God can do in my life, I made up my mind that God would have all of William Booth that there is. And this leads us to this. Let's put this up here, Sierra. We're going to end with this thought. This is going to get deep. So here in Luke chapter 14, when you study the life of Jesus, now I I get it. I cried out to God because I thought I was dying. So I get it. So a lot of people, they have a financial struggle. They call out to God. They have a health issue. They call out to God. So I get it. And so when you study the life of Jesus, people were showing up because he fed the 5,000. Hey, man, I heard about these cracked open five loaves and two fish and man 5,000 men plus women and children man let's let's look let's I'm hungry let's go listen to Jesus preach because he might feed us I'm being honest and so Jesus is getting all these multitudes that are following him and he understands some people are only following him because they're mad at the Roman government and some people are only following him because he healed the blind man and and so people were coming because they wanted to see the miracles and they wanted to be fed and they wanted their needs met But they really weren't surrendering. They they, they weren't getting it yet. And so Jesus comes in here in Luke chapter 14, and he says, listen, let's just put a line in the sentence. Let's just just cut to the chase, okay? And he turned to them, and he said this. Look at the next verse. I'm hurrying. That's what he said, verse 26. Let's let's, let's cut to the chase. It's okay. Listen, and God uses those things. Amen? God uses those things to get our attention. I, I, I understand it. But man, oh man, I've been in church long enough that, that, you know, if you do certain things to grow your church, you got to keep doing those things to keep the people. Well, I came because you had this event, or I came because you did this, and, and you stopped doing it, and it's like, peace out, I'm gone. It's like, whoa. You know, were you here because you love the Lord, or just be... Anyway, Jesus said, this is what he said. He said, if anybody wants to come to me, now, I know this is hard, and... I thought, Jesus, Jesus you, listen, in Matthew 22, you said Jesus said we're supposed to love our neighbor, and now he's saying hate? And not just hate anybody. My father and mother, isn't that one of the 610 commands, honor your father and mother, for your days will be long on the earth, right? Isn't that one of the commands? Jesus coming, if you look up the word hate, this is what it means. Love less than. That's what it means. So Jesus is, is cutting to the chase, Okay. And and I'm not here to preach on the relationships between kids and parents. What I'm trying to do is focus on Jesus saying, this is what's going to happen if I'm Lord. Okay? If you don't hate your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brethren, yet even your own life, you can't be my disciple. See, there was another time that Jesus, when he was talking about communion, we're going to take communion at the end of church. And people were coming because of the blessings. They were coming because of the miracles. They were coming because he was feeding the multitudes. And Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll have no part of me. And the Bible says many departed from him, and they were angry. They they were offended at his saying. 
And then Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, it's going to be hard for people to make it into the kingdom. Broad's the, the, the way that leads to destruction, but narrow the way that leads to salvation. Narrow. And so Jesus comes in and he says, you're going to have to draw a line in the sand and say, whatever my relationship status is with my family and with others, they will not pull me away from my walk with God. That's basically what he's saying. Amen. You can't let anybody, you, you, you can't let anybody stand in your way of serving the Lord. And you'd be amazed, in, in my 30 years of pastor, you'd be amazed at the examples I've seen through the years of people who've let family members or spouses or even children I, I've never seen anything like it now. I, I want you to understand what I'm saying it cause, because I've got children and I got 10 grandchildren. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so, so, I, so I get it. But what is the obsession with idolizing our children nowadays? Like our children are gods and we worship everything they do and everything. Listen, we need to stop that. You're setting because your child's able to get you to compromise and, and, and man, how come you're not committed to church? How come, well, you know, I got this and go to, quit idolizing your children. You run your home and you say, we're going to serve the Lord and don't let anything going on in the life of any of those other family members keep you from doing what you know you need to be doing. You set the standard. Well, that went over really good. Go to the next verse. Oh, man. And if you don't bear your cross... So he says, first, I'm putting a line in the sand with all relationships. So that's the first part. All relationships, none can come before me. None. None. I don't care what everybody influences you to do or what impact they've had in your life. I don't even care what relationship you have with him, even if they're your blood. I don't care. I come before them. So that's the first. Then secondly, he says, bear the cross. What do I mean? Jesus bore the cross. No, this is what he's saying. You got to die to self. Because anybody who put a cross on their shoulders and went up to Golgotha to die, they knew they ain't returning alive. They're dying. But that's a death sentence. They're not coming back. So Jesus says, one, don't let anybody stand in the way. Number two, you're going to have to die out to self. And then look at what he says here. Go to this next one. Who, Jesus, which of you intending to build a tower doesn't sit down first and count the cost and whether you have sufficient to finish it? Go to the next verse. I'll explain this. Go to verse 29. Let's happily, after you've laid the foundation, you're unable to finish it, and everybody mocks you. Verse 30. They'll look at you and say, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Verse 31. I mean, the word's convicting itself. Or what king going in to make war against another king doesn't sit down first and consult the others to see if they're able with 10,000 to meet those that come against with 20,000. Verse 32. Or else while the other is a great way off, he sends an uh, ambassador or an ambassador and desireth conditions of peace to try to, well, I mean, we don't have enough to go through this, man. We don't have enough soldiers. Let's make a peace treaty. This is verse 33. This is what gets me. So one, don't let relationships stand in the way of serving me. Number two, you've got to die to self. And then Jesus comes in in verse 33, and he says, likewise, whoever doesn't forsake all. Now, I did plenty of cross-references on this because I'm like, I want to know what he means by all here. Okay? Is he talking about money? I can't forsake all money. So what's he talking about? Well, you've got to look at the text. He talks about relationships. He talks about your own life. He talks about it. So when Jesus says all, he means every part of your life has to be for. What, is, what does he mean by forsaken? Well, when you do a study of this, this is what it means. Renunciation. That's what it means. Write that down. So when Jesus says to forsake, there's two words that come up when I, when I said this in the Greek. It's renunciation, and it's also the word renounce. What? Does he mean by that? To, to, to have renunciation in your life, this is what it means. To relinquish, to abandon all of our rights, titles, and ambitions and disown. Oh, my word. Did you hear what I just said? I've got to be able to relinquish and abandon all my rights, all my titles, all my ambitions, everything about me. My dreams, my goals, my future, my career, 
My money, my time, my talent, my tra- everything, everything. I have to renounce it. What? Because when you look up the word renounce, it, 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 it is what an immigrant to another country does when they leave one country and go to another. In order to become a citizen of another country, you have to renounce the rights you had in the former country that you were a citizen of. So Jesus is saying, you were a citizen of the world because you were born in the world and you were born in the flesh, but now you're part of the kingdom of God. And in order for you to understand the kingdom and receive the benefits of the kingdom, you have to renounce your citizenship that you had before you got saved. What? (laughs) That means you got to give 100% allegiance to this new country. There must be a renunciation of my past life and a total submission to the present one. In God's kingdom, he accepts nothing short of 100% allegiance to him. Put up this next slide. This is what renounce means. Are you all here with me today? Renounce means to voluntarily give up, to put aside and leave behind, and to give up by formal declaration. Now, some of you might not understand this because you've never been through this. But when I got saved, I renounced, and I did it verbally, and I did it in the atmosphere. I, I told Satan, I renounce this lifestyle. I, I, I told him, death and life is in the power of the tongue. And I let the enemy be known. I renounce the music. I renounce the drugs. I renounce the alcohol. I renounce the sinful lifestyle. I renounce it all. And I made a formal public declaration when I did it. And that's what Jesus says. You can't be my disciple if you don't renounce things. If you don't renounce it. Now, church family, I, I want to say this, and, and then I got a couple of scriptures and then we'll close. I, I really don't think people realize when they give their heart to the Lord what goes on. I, because in Luke chapter 14, Jesus uses this as an example. And he says, you need to consider the cost. And I don't think people consider the cost. I, it, 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 it's like the Lord's sitting us down and he says, listen. <laughs> Hold on for a second. Let's talk about this. Okay. So this is what's going to happen <laughs> if you say that you want to follow me and be a disciple. You might lose all your friends. You might lose all your dreams and hopes and ambitions and titles, all of it. All of it. Um, I have access now to everything in your life. And that when I say I want this, you're going to give it to me freely because you renounced everything else. I, I don't think... Is anybody here with... I, I, th- this is not the Christianity we're hearing in America. Because... What we're hearing in America is what God can do for me when the gospel is what I do for God. Now, listen, don't get me wrong. God does do a lot for us. Deuteronomy 6, he said, don't forget what I've done for you. That's in the seeking first the kingdom and everything else will be added to you. All the other, but my heart and my passions and and everything will be submitted to his lordship. Am I making any sense in here? Is is anybody listening to me? I don't think people understand because this is what I, we come to church and we say, I believe in Jesus and, and, and this is what I want to do, Lord. I want to merge the citizenship of this world with my citizenship in heaven. And I, can I merge the two and make it work? I, Jesus, I know your word says that I've got to do this. I know your word says I need to renounce this. I know your word says, but come on, Jesus. Listen, I didn't write it. I didn't write the plan of salvation. I didn't write the commands of God. I didn't write the terms and the conditions between giving my heart and my life to him. I didn't write those things. He did. And I really don't think people understand. Now, when I gave my heart to the Lord, it was right before my 20th birthday. And so, so. I mean, I'm sitting back and I'm thinking, through all your 20s, oh yeah, through all your 20s, through all your 30s, yeah, through all my 30s, through all your 40s when you hit a midlife crisis, don't tell me you don't hit it because in one way or another, all of us start reevaluating our life when we hit that stage. 
It's just the way it is. Even then, yep. Ooh. Every Sunday. Ten percent. I mean, it's, I'm doing it now because I'm old, used up, and I got saved. And in the, the rest of my life, the rest of your life, you, you got to renounce everything. Oof, I don't know if I could do that. That's why Jesus said, consider the cost. That before you build a tower, you assess, do I have enough to complete it? Am I willing, when I hit a midlife crisis, and my hormones are going everywhere, am I still going to serve Jesus? Or when my buddies start coming back and want to get me back in sin, am I still going to want to serve Jesus? And man, Jesus, come on, Jesus, it's easy to tithe when I'm not making so much, but man, when I'm making all that money, still 10%. Give up my Sundays? Oh, come on. During football season? Are you kidding me? Jesus. Now, some of you are sitting back and, and, and you might think, oh, Pastor, listen, I know what I'm talking about. I, I, I have seen people run after shiny objects their whole life. I, I, I've seen people run back to the pig pen. I, I've seen people run back to their sin. I, I've seen people give in to things that I'm like, I'm like, what were you thinking? What were you thinking? Think. Have you ever seen a what were you thinking moment in somebody's life? What were you thinking? We don't think about that stuff. Jesus, I'm just, I'm in the middle of a fire and I need some insurance to get me out of this thing. And God goes, whoop, pulls you out of it. Oh, wow. And he says, if you want to serve me, if you want to be my disciple, you got to renounce. See, church. My family turned their back on me and thought I was crazy. All the people I thought were my friends, the very week, the very week I got saved. I'll never forget, I was standing out in front of the apartment I was living in. It was nighttime. And they were, and they were standing there. And, they, man, it, it was ready to party the next weekend. And because I was the one with the job, I was the one that funded the partying. And we're going to do some, nope, guys. What? Wasn't no social media then, so word just got back to them. What? Nope, guys. And I remember them standing there, and we're like, ooh, man, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can agree to the terms and the conditions of this friendship. And I remember standing out there and telling them, I love you, but I'm serving Jesus. If you leave me, that's on you. And they left. And see, some of us have got to be willing to do it all in order to serve the Lord. Let's put this next, let's, and we'll end. Am I here today? <laughs> he that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confess and forsake. When you confess your sins, there's also a forsaking that goes with it. I confessed my sin to the Lord, but did you complete it? Did you finish it? Did you agree I will renounce and forsake? Do you see that? It's more than just, man, I prayed a generic prayer. I confessed my sin. Yeah, but did you, are you forsaking your life? Go to the next verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. It says, we've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. This is what he says. When you get saved, you're going to renounce these things dishonesty and walking and craftiness and handling the word of God deceitfully. Go to the next verse. Are you, are you, are you, are you getting this? Romans 6, 12. Don't let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust thereof. Go to the next verse. This, this, this was, but I'm under grace. But it says, well, you don't yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness. What's he saying? I will not allow me now as the temple of the Holy Spirit to now be used as an instrument of unrighteousness to sin. But now I'm renounced, I'm yielding myself to God as those that are alive from the dead, as your members, as instruments of righteousness. And again, that deals with everything that goes on in your body. Sexual sin, alcohol, drugs, addictions, everything. My body was saved from sin, and I'm now going to make it an instrument of righteousness and not unrighteousness. Are you seeing that? Look at the next verse. Because sin will not have dominion over me anymore. 
Yeah, but pastor, right there it says, I'm not under the law. I'm under, I'm under, I'm under grace. No, actually, it's different. It's actually, it's actually more strict. <gasps> Why? Because the grace he's talking about there is empowerment from the Holy Spirit. They didn't have the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. God gave a command, and they had to obey it. In the New Testament, God said, here's my command, but I'll give you my spirit to give you the strength you need to obey. So now, see, us New Testament believers, we've watered this down so much that we think, well, I'm under grace. That means I can do anything I want. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say that. What the Bible says is what grace is. It says, now I have a power to overcome that sin where in the Old Testament they didn't. I got the presence of God living in me. That when I'm weak, he's strong. Hallelujah. Go to the next verse. Shall we sin because we're not under the law and now we're under grace? God forbid. Because it says, any of you think that it's okay that go ahead and continue to live under sin because now you're not under the law? He says, God forbid. Go to the next verse. I'm hurrying. He says, don't you understand that to whom you yield yourself to, you become a servant of it to obey? That he's saying, this is why you've got to renounce everything. So the enemy doesn't have any authority over you anymore. So strongholds don't have authority over you anymore. So relationships don't have authority over them. Bad decisions you've made and generational cycles. No longer, you need to renounce it. Renounce it. Cut it off. Cut off every curse that's traveled down through your bloodline. You renounce every bad decision you made before you came to know Christ and now you're reaping the harvest. All of it. You renounce it and you cut it off. Because if you don't, you're still serving that. Are you getting this? Go to the next verse. We're, we're, we're ending. He says, but God be thanked that though you were servants of sin, but you've obeyed from the heart. That form of doctrine that was delivered to you. Now you know you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's going to be a hard issue, and God will give you the grace to overcome it. Verse 18, the final verse in this portion of Scripture. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of us. How am I free from sin? I renounced its power on my life. Are you are y'all you, getting this? 1 Peter chapter 4, last scripture. Then I will no longer live the rest of my time on, in this life, in the flesh, the lusts of men, but to the will of God. I renounce it all. Verse 3 and 4. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we used to walk in lasciviousness and lust and excessive wine and revelings and banquetings and abominable idolatry, all these things. That's what I used to do. I don't do that anymore because I renounced it. Verse 4. Wherein they think it's strange that you don't run with them anymore. <laughs> and now they'll speak evil of you. Isn't that what it says? I have more in my life now than I could have ever dreamed. If I'd have stayed on the path that I was on. And when I gave my heart to the Lord, I said, Lord, all my dreams, you know, everything, every gift, everything, I give it to you. And then God, with a sense of humor, said, fine, I'm going to call you to pastor. <laughs> oh, oh, you're going to do that? We're going to see if you're serious. Go pastor. Amen. Stand with me. <laughs> 